Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a tremendous evening with Catherine Finney, keynote speaker for Career Success Month. Catherine will be in conversation with Laura Bacon, founder of The Third. This program is part of Maryland Libraries Together, a statewide initiative sponsored in part by the Maryland State Library Agency, hosted by public libraries throughout Maryland. Uh, Career Success Month provides library customers with expert guidance from, uh, from experts on a wide spectrum of business to job advancement topics. Uh, the full schedule of classes can be found at the Maryland Libraries Together webpage. We will be sharing a lot of information and links, but please don't worry. All of these will be sent to you in a follow-up email tomorrow. After the survey, we will send out, uh, after the event, we will send out a survey and we would love to hear from you. It really helps us with our planning and future programs. This event is being recorded and will be available later on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, as I mentioned. Meanwhile, please do add your questions in, in the Q&A and your comments in the chat. We love hearing from you and we will uh, have time for questions towards the end. Uh, I'm Rohini Gupta with the Howard County Library System, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank Nini Began, Carrie Sanders, and my co-lead for this program, Jillian Walker from Prince George's County Memorial Library System. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Catherine Finney and Laura Bacon. Catherine Finney is a serial entrepreneur and investor. Through her venture fund, 30 plus angel investments and mentorship of entrepreneurs, Catherine is fostering economic, financial and social opportunities for black owned businesses across the US. Named one of the most influential women in tech, Catherine is the founding managing partner of Genius Guild. This Chicago-based venture fund invests in scalable businesses led by Black founders using innovation to build and promote healthy communities. Some of her investments include Health in Her Hue, Stimulus, and Rare Breed. A Yale-trained epidemiologist, Catherine founded Digital Undivided after selling her media company, The Budget Fashionista, making her one of the first Black women to successfully exit a startup. Catherine has received numerous honors and awards, and that list is absolutely too long for me to list here. And she has been voted by her peers as one of the most important venture capitalists in the Midwest. Her new book, Build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business If You're Not a Rich White Guy, made the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list in its first week of release. Build the Damn Thing is a hard-won, battle-tested guide for every entrepreneur who the establishment has left out. We are so happy to have you here, Catherine. I am so excited to be here. Our moderator tonight, Laura Bacon, the founder of The Third, is a lifelong community organizer, educator, and activist. She grew up in Columbia, MD, yay, and returned here to teach high school languages and alternative education, earning her Howard County's World Language Teacher of the Year Award. The Third is a revolutionary nonprofit supporting women of color entrepreneurs through access, education, and community. Laura's methodology for building co-creative communities moved her to create MOD, a community building consulting firm that offers concept plans, consulting, and coaching. Her innovative and intentional way of building community has brought her the opportunity to serve on and lead various teams and committees, including Howard Community College's Commission on the Future and Brooke Learman's transition team. Welcome, Laura, and thank you so much. Thank you, Rohini. I'm so excited to be here. And it's over to you, Laura. 
All right. Um, I'll just say thank you again to the Howard County Library System. Um, everyone who's on this call knows how ridiculously amazing they are. So I'm so glad that they were able to host today and to host this amazing keynote speaker, Catherine Finney. So Catherine, welcome. I'm very excited to get into conversation with you tonight. I'm so excited to talk with you and learn more from everyone who's joining us today. Yes. Um, so we're going to just kind of jump right in. Um, as Rohini said, put your questions in question and answer. We're going to talk for a little bit and then um, I'll head over there to make sure that your questions get answered by Catherine before we finish up. Um, and actually, before I start, I'm going to say one quick thing. I just want to shout out all the members of the third, third staff and the third community out there um, for joining us on this and thanks for supporting um, such a wonderful event. So, keeping it in the realm of business. Um, I want you to think about how you got here, but I want you to think about it kind of like a slide deck. Um, you know, what would be some of the main slides for how you got from where you were to where you are now? Well, first of all, that's a really interesting way to put it, because as a venture capitalist, all I do is look at pitch decks and slides for most of the day. So if I had to put sort of my life in slides, like, the first slide would be um, growing up in Milwaukee in the early part of my childhood, coming from a working class family in which technology literally changed our lives. My father went from a brewery worker to an early data entry clerk um, in Minneapolis, then went to be an executive at Microsoft and was an executive at EMC when he passed away. And I was a kid watching this transition and how much technology changed the fortune of my family. That would be one slide. The other slide would be me as a teenager growing up in Minnesota where I never fit in. Um, I was quirky. I mean, I was like this at, at age <laughs> um, And my friends will tell you like, Catherine hasn't changed that much. Um, and so that would be the other slide and how that influenced me to go um, to school in the East Coast. The next slide would be going to school in the East Coast, becoming an epidemiologist, going to Yale, all of those sort of things and the impact of that. The next slide would be getting married, starting the budget fashionista. The slide after that would be the budget fashionista goes um, kind of viral before viral was even a thing. I started the budget fashionista in 2002. How many of us remember 2002 and what okay. blogs look like? In 2002 and in the book I have like a screenshot of what the blog looked like in 2002 I'm like and that was like a hot design back then it was like woo you know if you had a photo that was like oh my gosh you were like really balling on your web design and then the next slide would be me selling the budget fashionista and then going to work for blog her which was this massive woman-led organization <clears throat> the slide after that would be blog her sales I start on um, Digital and Divided. We start as a conference. Slide after that, Digital and Divided becomes a big thing. You do Project Diane, which was this really world-changing, at least in the VC world-changing report, where we documented the fact that Black women in particular, and then later um, Latinas, were just not receiving any venture funding. Um, and when we first did the report, which was in 2016, Black women had received 0.006% of all venture funding up until that point. So basically we received no funding. <laughs> and, and that caused a lot of shakeup in, in venture. Um, right after that would be me leaving Digital and Divided to start Genius Guild. And the slide after that would be Genius Guild. And why did I start Genius Guild? Um, a lot of it came from, actually, there would be a slide before that. It would be the Dooney Fund, um, which is a philanthropic fund that I started with my own money to honor my grandmother, who's a Black woman entrepreneur, um, who was born at a time where to be a Black woman with big ideas was not something that was encouraged by anyone. Um, and she had a very big impact on my life. Um, and so after that, seeing the importance and how moving capital, the impact that had on other black women entrepreneurs, especially moving capital in a way where I didn't ask for permission to do it. I just did it. Um, and, 
and it had a profound impact on my life. Then it would be Genius Guild, which is our venture fund. Um, we invest in um, exceptional Black founders building high-scale, scalable companies that really help create healthy communities. Um, and we do it around the social determinants of health, which are you know, economic, community, um, your environment, healthcare access, so a very global view of health. Um, and then the, probably the last slide would be something fun of like what I like to do for fun. <laughs> and, um, I'm a big swimmer. And so I would do that. I'm a mom. That takes up time for those of you who are parents, you know exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that is a job in and of itself. Um, I like to read. I'm learning to roller skate. So all the things that make me a human being outside of just the business. And that, and then it would be like a fun slide at the end, um, usually like a quote. So the ending slide would be this quote I have from, I don't know where I got it, but it's like a, a cross stitch that says, you know, David Boy made me do it. And so that would probably be like the final slide. I love it. I love that. And I mean, you were really quick with that slide deck as well. Well, well done. Um, so looking back at something that you talked about as one of your slides, the Dooney Fund, um, and we kind of touched on this a little bit before we started, but um, the Dooney Fund, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about what the Dooney Fund does, why you started it, and how you see it playing a role in your future. And I will say that when I was reading the book, it caught my eye because very early on in the journey of building the third, um, we received one of the grants from the Dooney Fund. And it was one of the first times that we've really felt seen as an organization. So I'm excited to hear how you, how it started and what you're, what you're looking forward to in the future. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that. Um... And, and I did say to Laura, I'm probably going to get a little misty talking about the Dooney Fund. The Dooney Fund was created from really the love and support that was poured into me by my grandmother, Catherine Dooney Hill. Her nickname was Dooney. I have no idea why we called her Dooney. No one in my family knows why we call her Dooney, but we called her Dooney, including friends. Like my friends called her Dooney. Everyone called her Dooney. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until I was 12 that I realized I was actually named after her. Like you're and she's like, yes, <laughs> like you didn't know that. But she was a black woman entrepreneur who happened to be born at a time. She was part of, you know, what we call the greatest generation, where being a black woman with big ideas was not something that was celebrated. My grandmother was brilliant and had amazing ideas. And if she had been born in a different time, she would have been, you know, the Oprah, the Cardi B. Um, she's very, very fast and very fast and forward. And so in many ways, and what I'm doing is, is li living her dreams. And one of the, the big sort of quotes that I often think of when I think of her is that we are living our ancestors' wildest dreams. We're manifesting their wildest dreams. I am manifesting my grandmother's wildest dreams. Um, and so during the pandemic, I was feeling pretty helpless. I was supposed to go visit hmm. her. I had a, a family trip that we used to always do around my birthday. This was in April. And to, it was going to Alaska on a cruise leaving from Seattle. And if we remember in April, 2020, the epicenter of COVID was Seattle. And one of the main vectors was cruise ships. So it was the vacation that we're like, it's never gonna happen. We don't think that ship has left yet. And it's like three years later. And so I took that money and wanted to do something because I couldn't, do anything. And I think a lot of us, we were feeling kind of helpless, especially those of us who were fortunate to have healthy families, fortunate to live in spaces that were protected and safe and could access food and had resources. And so started to do any fun with $10,000 of my own money. The goal was really to just give it out to a hundred Black women entrepreneurs. It was to just be kind of like, I see you as a Black woman entrepreneur. I know how hard this is. And I know when bad things happen, it really happens to us. It happens to everyone, but it really happens to us. And I just want you to not give up and to know that someone sees you and someone cares about you and someone understands. That was literally the only criteria. We kept it on purpose, very simple, the application. We're like, it should not be more than five minutes. And if it's five minutes, even we thought that was too much. It was a relatively small amount of money. Um, 
And what happened was people wanted to join in. And we ended up giving out over $150,000 worth of um, really, we call them micro investments to over a thousand black women entrepreneurs. Wow. Um, within a six week time period. Ooh. And it profoundly changed the way I thought about money and capital, who has it, who can move it. It empowered me to think bold. Um, it empowered me to rethink how we distribute capital. It empowered me to rethink my power. Because at the time, yeah. I didn't realize what power I had. Um, and I think as women, particularly as, as women of color, people of color, we sometimes forget that we are powerful beings. Um, we have power. We, we do. Um, others may squash it. Others may try to re redirect it. But we have power. And that's what came from the Dooney Fund. It's probably one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. And so far, we've given out close to 3,000 um, micro-investments in Black women entrepreneurs. And nothing makes my heart swell more than to hear from and to be able to meet other Dooney's. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to kind of transition us into tapping into your expertise around business. Um, now that we've, you know, gotten your slide deck, we know about your journey, how you got here. Um, so I would imagine that there are quite a few people in the audience who are running businesses of their own. So I wanted to kind of ask a couple questions that might help somebody in a way that, um, they can move their business forward um, after this webinar. So thinking about a startup, what are the first steps to getting a startup off the ground? Like, how do you even know it's worth it? How do you know that your idea is an actual business? So the definition of a business, and this is, I think, where a lot of us kind of get hung up on, is that someone is going to pay you a premium for what it is that you're producing, meaning they're gonna pay you the, the, the cost that they're gonna pay you, the money they're gonna exchange with you is equal to the cost to make the goods plus the premium for your time. And the cost to make the goods needs to include your time and salary too. And a lot of people when they're getting start, start up, they don't include their time in it your time is money, it's important. And so a business is that the cost of goods, the cost that it makes to make it, plus whatever what is commonly called in business margin, whatever is the normal margin for whatever industry you're in. So in retail, it could be you know 40 to 50% is usually the sort of standard range. Um, and consumer packaged goods, depending on what the consumer packaged good is, that's like, you know, if you're making, you know, olive oil or you're making beauty products or something like that, that's considered in the consumer packaged goods category. It could be up to 90%. It is very easy to find what the average margin is in whatever your industry is by just simply Googling, you know, average margin of beauty products or average margin of olive oil or average margin of, you know, a software application. And so you should be able to get that pretty, pretty easily. Um, and that just the cost of goods is what you should be charging. And you know you have a business when you have a number of people, non-family, <laughs> that's very important. Your family loves you. They want you to win. So they'll buy your thing, whether or not, you know, it's great or not. You need people who don't love you <laughs> to, to buy it. Um, and once you get a certain mass of people, and that can depend on what your, so if it's consumer packaged goods, it could be, you know, you have a hundred people who are consistently, hundred customers each month who are buying it. Um, if it's a higher thing, like an enterprise software, like you're selling a service to a corporation, you might only need two or three consistent customers a month in order to reach that sort of level. But once you have that, then you know you have a business. A lot of people get that business is confused with hobbies. Mm. You don't, if people are not willing to pay a premium, if they're not willing to pay that margin cost, that cost to make it, plus the additional margin percentage, then it really is a hobby. It really is a hobby. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
And which is not a bad thing you talk about not in your book. Thing. Like a hobby oh. is a is a wonderful thing, but understanding that a business has some defining factors to it um, could help with any sort of tension or or lack of forward movement people might be feeling. So hopefully that's a that's a good tip to for people to take it with them. Um, we talked a little bit about slide decks at the beginning, and you talked about pitches. What is your advice for someone? Like, what are some like top three things someone needs to either have in their pitch? What kind of personality do they need to bring to their pitch? What are your what are your go tos when you're looking at a pitch and say, "Oh, that's a good one." I think it depends on the stage. I mean, particularly early stage investment which is what I do. And these are usually before people have significant revenue. Um, so they might just only have the three or four customers, but maybe, you know, they're in this rapid growth. So they don't have, um, they're not positive, right? The revenue is not in the black yet. Um, and at that point, it's really important to be a good storyteller, like to be able to tell your story and to get people very, very excited in what you're doing and why what you do matters. I think right now, and this is across the board, we're in a very tight capital market, meaning you know money was flowing pretty freely for the you know several years before. Now money is not flowing as freely. So being able to tell your story and, and to be able to tell it quickly um, is really really important. I think your example that you gave of like thinking in slide decks is like a great way I think for um, entrepreneurs to sort of formulate how they talk about their companies, even saying, hey, I'm going to give you my slide deck intro. Here's, you know, like me, I think that's a great way to frame it. But telling stories is really important. Second is know your numbers. Mm. Know how many customers you have, how much it costs to get those customers. Know the lifetime value of the customer. So those are very, 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 very important. So the the customer acquisition cost, how much it costs to get the customer, also known as CAC, C-A-C, is incredibly important for me as an investor. Like, I want to know how much it costs you to get this customer, because then in my mm -hmm. mind, I figure out how much it's going to cost to get you to a certain scale. So I need to know that in order to be able to, to do a variety assessment. Then I need to know how valuable this customer is once you get them. And the mm. higher that number is, that lifetime value, the better it is. So if you only have five customers a month that you're acquiring, but those customers are worth $100,000 a piece, that's very different than having 100 customers that are only worth $50, right, dollars. And so that tells me how you're going to have to scale in order to reach a certain level. And lastly, I would say, particularly if you're looking for any sort of venture funding, private equity, is to make sure you understand the benchmark. This is something mm -hmm. that I've learned in the past, you know, six months or so as, again, it's been harder to get money. Understand where you need to be at in order to reach each level. Um, and there's a lot of investors who've written about this and been very public about, okay, here's where we think you need to be in order to get money from us. Um, and it's based upon our economics. We have bosses too. <laughs> there, I have people I have to answer to. Um, and so I, I need you to be at a certain level so that it makes sense for me to make the investment. And those would be the three sort of things I would, would say. If you are focused on your customer acquisition costs, the lifetime value, building up your team, which becomes very, very important at the beginning um, and telling your story, then that last part becomes a little bit easier to, to reach. But those are all very important things that I look for as an investor. Thank you. That was very helpful. And now I'm, I, as I'm thinking about somebody growing their business, I kind of want to flip to the other side, which is how do you know when to let go? Mm -hmm. How do you know when it's time to move on to the next thing? Or maybe it's to or you have another idea that you want to put focus on, how do you know when it's time to move on? That's a great question. Um, and I find that a lot of entrepreneurs overstay, <laughs> especially entrepreneurs of color, because we don't want to fail. We think failure is bad. We're afraid of failure. And in the book, I write like basically a whole chapter about failure. <laughs> and I have failed spectacularly at times. But it's, 
those failures is not an endpoint, it's a data point. And I think it's really important to think Ooh. that way. Ooh, say that one more time. Say that one more time. Not an endpoint, it's a data point. And you get a lot of data from failing. So my family, we had this, um, and I talk about this in the book, we had this dry cleaning business that somehow we thought it was really smart to start after my father passed away. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, no family's like, let's go start a business after, you know, you have the, the patriarch die, but that's what we did. Um, in hindsight, it was like a horrible thing to do. But, and there was so many things I learned from that. Um, I learned a lot about working in family, that whatever mm -hmm. role you have in your family is the role that's going to come over the business if you've never worked with your family and business before. So if you are little, little cousin, um, you know, my nickname in my family was like Huggy. So, you know, like little Huggy, <laughs> if not like this <laughs> educated woman, whatever, I'm still in their mind, 12 year old Huggy, right? And I made it really difficult to like step into sort of this leadership role in the business and understanding that knowing how to work with consultants, that's a big thing. Um, and how to manage uh, vendors like legal and accounting to make sure that you're not paying a bunch of fees for things that you don't need to pay a bunch of fees from. Um, all of these things came from this very painful lesson of, of running that business. And it made it so that my next business, the Budget Fashionista, became quite successful. But it was because of that failure that I learned. And so I think what is in, one of the ways you can tell whether or not it's to leave is one, do a gut check with yourself. Do you really want to be doing this? Like, honestly, like, do you really want to be doing this? Um, and giving your permission, giving yourself permission to pivot or leave. And, and knowing that the only person that really matters in that decision is, is you. Um, and so okay. really focusing on that, um, looking at the numbers, again, you know, the cost of goods, plus whatever the average margin is in whatever your industry is, if you cannot charge that, those two things together, then it's going to be difficult for you to turn it into a business. Um, and, and you might want to think about, oh, maybe it's time for me to, to go. Um, unless you're independently wealthy, most of us don't have time to wait for everyone else to catch up, right? That, that can be kind of hard to do. Um, and so really think about your own personal finances. In the book, I talk about figuring out what your exit number is. I don't believe you should leave your day job until you reach whatever that exit number is. And simply that's just the amount of money you need to exist. And not like, you know, bling bling exists, like to live in a way that's going to keep you healthy, happy, and whole to be able to do entrepreneurship, which is incredibly difficult. And so whatever that number is, and I actually have a calculation in the book where you can like figure it out, help you figure out what your number is. Um, once you reach that consistently for six months, then you know that this is like a thing. This is like, it can support you and can support your family. Um, and so things like that will help you determine whether or not you can actually, you know, take this into something where this is something you should go with or something that you should leave and think of something else. That's super helpful. I think that's um, your comment about overstaying feels pertinent to everybody. You know, I think that's a that's a feeling that we all feel, especially if you've built something. You know, where do you move? How do you move? Or if you've built something that nobody is is buying, then yeah. being able to say it's time. And um, so I appreciate those those factors. So we've been talking sort of around it, but let's talk about the book. Yeah. Um, I want to start with the cover, which is just fantastic. Um, those of you on the call, if you haven't seen the cover of this book, uh, Catherine looks like easy breezy and beautiful on the front, um, right next to the, <laughs> right next to the subtitle of how to build a success, start a successful business if you're not a rich white guy. Um, so talk to me a little bit about this cover and how it came to be. Um, it feels like what anyone would want their book cover to look like. You know, this is a different type of business book. And I think everyone who's read it is like, I've never read a business book like this. Um, the way I talk is like the way the, the book is written. It's true. It's true. Um, and it's funny too. And people are like, I've never read a business book that had like real information. And it's also funny. And like, you know. Um, and so the cover really came about, 
I wanted a cover that reflected who I was. And some of the initial cover designs just had the words on it, like go to Van City, you know? And I was like, that doesn't really say anything. Um, I was lucky enough to have an ally in my publisher who, um, Adrian, who's the founder of Portfolio Books, which is an imprint of Random House, you know, he's a, he's a curmudgeonly old white guy, but he was very insistent on me being on the cover um, and saying, look, that, that's what makes this book unique is her, it's her voice. And we need to make sure that this book cover reflects her voice. He was a very strong advocate. Um, and he was also the boss, so he's a great person to have hmm. as an advocate. And that goes to show the importance of creating allies and developing allyship with others who have a voice. Even though as the author, I had a voice, it made it much stronger that it was like, the boss also echoing what I said. Um, and then I was really adamant about it being like, you know, colorful. If you open up the book, the inside cover has like stars on it. Um, so it's like very, like a very different business book. And it's one of the first business books written about entrepreneurship by a Black woman, period. Um, especially published by a major publisher. So I was like, this has to come out the gate looking different. And I think having that allyship with my publisher and me being very clear about what my vision was and is and understanding people is what led towards the book being on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list for several weeks. And now, less than six months after it's coming out, we're in a second printing. And Ooh. which is major. Um, and, you know, as, as my mother noted, because um, no one's a better publicist for you than your mom, she, <laughs> it now says, you know, Wall Street Journal bestseller on the top. And so that to me is like, but it was creating allyship with someone else and being very clear about what my vision and goals were. And, and knowing that, this is what's going to make this book stand out. This is what's going to make people buy it. And I've heard so many things of people being in the airport and seeing the book. And they're like, wait a minute. There's like this book and there's this black woman and she's smiling and she has quirky glasses on. Like I would just have to stop and read it. And I end up buying your book because it was just like the first like page was like funny. And like, I just wanted to like, buy it. The parts that get, when you talk about it being funny or it being in your voice, the footnotes kill me. <laughs> the <laughs> every time there's a footnote if you haven't read the book I like I, that's where I was um highlighting the most is in the footnotes I think because not only does Catherine um add some comedy to the book but there's also like breaking down of business terms in a way that sounds like a human is doing it um instead of a machine and so that feels really really helpful was that intentional on your part to also mm -hmm. sort of teach some of these terms that are thrown around so um so loosely um, that maybe people don't feel the connection to the business world be just because of a word or two? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I read the book, what is it, The 48 Laws of Power? And, you know, it has like the little footnotes on the side that gave context. And I love that because it gave context to what you were saying. And I think what often happens, and one of the things that just really bugged me about the startup world an entrepreneurship world was this assumption that everybody knows what these words mean. Um, mm -hmm. That everyone knows what a customer acquisition cost is or a lifetime value, or everyone knows what a pitch deck is. You know, all these terms that there's an assumption that you know, and there's not a lot of space for you to say, I don't know. Um, it's not a, an industry that creates that ability to question and ask for clarity and definition. And so I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to assume that people know because there's a lot of stuff in the footnotes and definitions that I, I mean, totally knew while I was writing the book. But when I first got into this game, I had no idea that, like what this meant. No one had explained it. It was not anywhere you could find. It was hidden in, you know, sort of tech bro land. And I'm not a tech bro. So I never <laughs> learned. No one would ever share it and really wrote this book because I was like, I want to share the things that they are not sharing. I want this to be a resource that you can go to and written by someone who actually has been in the space for a while. So, and I think that that's one of the things that makes the book a little bit different is that like, I've been through it. 
Like I have been the only black person in the room. I've taken meetings on Sand Hill Road, which is where all the venture capitalists are. And also in Silicon Alley in New York and all these different places where I had to pitch to a group of dudes who were like very confused about why I was here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so I know what you're all going through. I had to accept funds from traditional lenders under um, traditional lenders because it was really hard for a traditional lender to get what I was doing. And so I'm um, forever grateful to ACOM for like supporting and, and giving me small business loans when I was building the bunch of Fashionista because there was no venture capital for me to receive. It just wasn't even a, a possibility for me. And so I knew and I understand what it means to be an entrepreneur and being in the hustle and trying to figure out where you're going to get capital from. How are you going to grow this business? How are you going to make sure that your family eats? How to make sure that you give enough time to the business, but also time to the people who love you and not forget about them. How do you bring the people who mm-hmm. love you in? Um, because our families can't necessarily write 50K checks. I was saying this to my, I am the friend and family in my family. Like, <laughs> there's no friend or family I can go to that, that is, that's me. Um, <laughs> And so how do I manage that? How do you manage, particularly when you come from families that are resource poor, meaning your family doesn't come from money and they read that you raised a bunch of money. How do you manage those expectations from them? Um, Mm -hmm. How do you enlist support of your family? That's one thing I talk a lot about of, you know, how do you build this personal advisory board? Um, and how your family can help you when they can't write a check. Because there's many things our families can do for us that are not necessarily writing capital. Um, in my case, my mother came and helped take care of my kid for a good four years. I would not have been able to build Digital and Divide It, nor would I have been able to start Genius Scale if my mother hadn't did that. Mm. It's plain and simple. Because um, I was able to focus on building my company knowing that my kid was being taken care of by someone who loved him and wanted to see you know, him win and succeed. That peace of mind was like, I don't know what type of check I could have wrote for that peace of mind. And, and so those are the things that your family can do that are not necessarily right capital. But I had never read a book that talked about family as a resource. It only talked about money from them, but it didn't take, talk about any of the other resources the in-kind support that your family could provide. And I wanted to make sure I highlighted that in the book because I come from a family that cannot write fifty or $100,000 checks to me. Thank you. That's really, that's, I mean, that's like a resource that's sitting right there that I'm sure a lot of people have not thought or tapped into. Um, and just in-kind in general, the wealth of in-kind support that can come from um, family, from friends, and from your just general community and network is huge. Um, when you are thinking about the book, and I know this is this is going to be a hard one, I think, but what's the one thing that you want someone to get out of it when they're reading their book? That you can build a damn thing. That you can do it. It's going to be hard. It's going to take a while. But you can do it. Everybody hear that? Okay. Um, And then I've always wondered this about um, anyone writing a book. What's something that didn't make it in the book that you wish had? You know, I have a lot of stories. I'm I'm from, I'm from Minnesota. I'm like the Rose, someone's like your Rose Nyland adventure capital. (laughs) 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 You got a story for everything, you know, from St. Olaf and that I've actually been to St. Olaf. But, but I'm not from St. Olaf. And so there's a lot of stories that didn't make it. Like there was one story about um, Darlene Gillard Jones, who um, was one of the co-founders of Digital Divide and I going on this like road trip in 2013, talking about um, black women in startups like around the country. And to the point where people called us the Thelma and Louise of tech. Cause we were, <laughs> and it felt that way. And so we had all these stories, but part of it was the importance of choosing a partner really well when you're building something, because we had to spend, um, we were stuck in a blizzard in Charlotte where we had to spend literally four days in a Holiday Inn together. 
um, because it couldn't go anywhere. I mean, they shut down Walmart. And any of you who live in anywhere where Walmart is, you know it's a serious when Walmart is closed. And so, (laughs) and we just sat and we ate ramen noodles because nothing was open. And we just talked. And and I don't know if I would have been able to build with anyone else like that because you have to, you have to, I, I firmly believe you actually have to like the people who you're building something with. When you're when you're starting out because it's so hard at the beginning the last thing you want is tension within your relationship with your partner like that's the last thing to actually truly build something you really do have to be in partnership and like them as people it doesn't mean that you have to be best of friends but you do have to like them as people and so that whole story was taken out um didn't get to write a lot about growth which will hopefully be the next mm-hmm. book about like okay, now that you started now what like, what do you do? How do you grow it? How do you scale it? Um, I touched a little bit on that in the in the venture capital investment chapter, but definitely it would be, the next book would be about growth. Like, how do you think about it? How do you grow it? Um, and then all the things that I didn't talk about, I also put two in the podcast. And so we have a podcast, mm-hmm. Build the Damn Thing. It's available on Apple, everything's the same name as the book where we go like really deep into like a lot of different topics, much deeper than I could in the book because of space constraints. Thank you so much for that added resource. Um, Everybody got that there is a podcast called Build the Damn Thing. So make sure you check that out for a deeper dive into um, Catherine's brain around building, uh, building your startup. So we've got Build the Damn Thing. We've got the podcast as well. What are a couple of other business related books that you would suggest for someone starting a business, running a business, trying to scale their business? You know, so I like four hour work week for no other reason that it gives you some thoughts on life hacks. And I think, you know, sometimes as, as marginalized people, we, we can make things more difficult because no one tells us that we can make it easy. Um, and so what I love about four hour work week, it gives us tools to make things easy, like how to automate stuff. The goal is not for it to be hard. That's not what it is. It's like, how do you make it? How do you bring it down? How do you make it easier? So, so that's one. Um, Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Guy also wrote the foreword to build the damn thing and he's yeah. a mentor. Um, I think it's a great book in thinking about how to start anything and getting some inspiration. Um, he has a lot of tools on like even, you know, how to do a pitch deck and things like that. Um, and then also I would encourage you to read books, any books that make you think differently. And that includes fiction. Um, I like to read uh, Magical Realism. Um, Gabrielle Marquez, um, is one of my favorite authors, author of 100 Years of Solitude um, and Love in the Time of Cholera. And I love reading him, Isabella Allende, others where it's yeah. like, because it's so creative and it so has nothing to do with investment, it helps me to think differently. I think of a different part of my brain. And I really want to encourage you to not only read the business books for inspiration and how to do this, but also read the books that you enjoy, who bring you into a different world. I am a bibliophile. I love books. I have so many books that I'm reading simultaneously um, that I really encourage you to, re- to, to read those books and continue to read those books that make you think. So now I'm torn. I had two like I had two questions that I was going towards, and now I'm 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 trying to think of which one to go to first. I'm gonna go to who what you're reading right now, since you were just talking about it. Is there one thing that you can share that you're reading right now with us? I'm reading two books. I'm reading How to Invest, which is a really interesting book of perspective from you know these top investors who just came out, and I'm reading Fleischman in Trouble which mm. is an eight, it's now a Hulu um, series about this couple going through divorce. It's a very interesting sort of book. So those are the two books I'm currently reading. Just finished Black Cake. I read that um, during the, the break. Um, and in March, I go on vacation around my birthday. I'll be reading 100 Years of Solitude. I'll read it like once a year. It kind of like keeps me connected. Um, 
Another great book, if you love historical fiction, is Devil in the White City, which is like, Ooh. I live in Chicago. I live actually in Hyde Park, and I live across the street from the Museum of Science and Industry, which is the only building left standing from the World's Fair. Um, but it is a fascinating book. It is, it is just fascinating and about history and all these sort of things. It's just one of my favorite books as well. Um, and it learned, and I learned a lot about my city too. Um, so yeah, I'm like a reader reader. Like I will, <laughs> you can ask me about books all day. I will tell you all sorts of stuff about books. I love it. Well, we're going to move on to some audience questions. Um, give me one second to use a different part of my brain while I just read a couple real quickly. Um, so we have a question from Joanne that asks, um, did many black female owned businesses take advantage of the COVID funds to support their business? And if not, why, why not? And for those that did, has the impact been lasting, do you think? So there were huge structural problems with the first rollout of the PPP loans, um, which were the loans that came as a result of, of the COVID loan. And the structural challenge was in order to get them, you have to have basically a private banker. You have to have somebody mm -hmm. who could walk you through the system. And very few people have private bankers. At Digital Divide at the time, we were able to get a, an early PPP loan. And the reason why we were able to was because we had a private banker. Because as a social enterprise, we had enough money to, to have this sort of dedicated person. If we did not have the dedicated person, we would not have had it. And that was one of the things that actually triggered Dooney Fund too, was that mm -hmm. we saw because of the amount of assets we had, we had access to money, more better access than those who did not have the same amount of assets, who should have had the same exact amount of access, actually should have had access before everyone. So as a result, the early stage was something like 95% of um particularly Black-led companies that applied for PPP loans didn't get them over the first one or two rounds. The subsequent rounds, we were able to, to get more. I don't think there's been a lot of research on the impact that has had, because um, it's only been about two years or so post. And so I would be very interested in seeing that. Um, there has been research on the fact that we, as a community, didn't really get it, we didn't get the funds. Um, and there has been some research on inequalities around the distribution of the fund, but not impact on, not a lot of research on the impact of those who receive the funds to then be able to um, continue to build their companies and have success. Got it. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions. I'm kind of kind of move them all together, come from together a little bit around publishing. So mm -hmm. how does one get published? Does one need a publisher? How do you even know that you think you might want to write a book? Where does, can you give us a little um, insight into that? Yeah, I think it depends on your goals. Um, you know, from a, from a business book standpoint, I wrote the book because I was meeting, you know, a thousand or so founders and seeing a thousand or so pitch decks a year and with the same issues were coming up. And it was like, you know what, I'm, instead of me just writing, you know, the same thing over and over again, I'm going to write a, a book that's literally like, this is how you do it. Um, and so that's where it came for me. Um, for you, you have to really sit down and determine why do you want to write this book? Do you want to build your prominence in the space and become an expert or be known as an expert? Is it that you just want people to see your story? Do you want it to generate sales for you? I think you have to really sit down and, and be very clear about what it is that you want. Um, and once you have that, then you'll determine how you go about publishing the book. Um, if you want to build credibility in your space, you may first write a book proposal. And this is for um, nonfiction books, not for fiction books. You might write a book proposal and then go see if you get an agent. It's very hard to get a traditional publisher without an agent. It's not impossible. It's just very, very hard to. You can imagine how many proposals and how many things that it, like editors get at the publishing houses. So if you can find a reputable agent, that will help you immensely. They'll also help you craft your proposal so that it's a better way to sell it. 
However, you don't need that. If you have uh, an already existing community that's very strong and is very active, you can self-publish. Amazon has amazing tools to self-publish. Um, to be honest, if your community is large enough and strong enough, you probably will get more money if you self-publish. Um, and so that might be a route. And then once you can prove the sales, you can then try to go to a traditional publisher and say, look, I was able to sell this without you. So imagine what I could sell with you. Um, and then that gives you a position of power to negotiate with. So there's many different ways you can sort of reach publishing, but it really depends on what it is your goals are and what it is that you want to achieve. Thank you. That's super helpful. And I think uh, that hit on a lot of different parts of people's questions. Um, we've got another couple of questions around Securing funding that's not necessarily VC related, like when you're first starting, what are your recommendations for how someone starts to um, build up some funds for their business? Is it crowdfunding? Is it grants? Uh, do you go straight to an investor? What, what do you recommend? So I talk actually a lot about this at the last chapter of the book, because I think people automatically want to go to an investor instead of really thinking about how do I figure out what it is that I'm building in my product and what is the least restrictive capital I can get that will allow me to figure out what is the capital I can get that will give me space to figure out exactly what it is that I'm doing. And sometimes venture is definitely not the right capital to get at that moment. So some of the ways that you can get it is grants, right? There are a lot of business grants particularly um, at the state level coming out of the Build Back Better um, initiative that was passed by the House last year. There's a lot of states now that have funding to invest in small businesses. Maryland is one of those states that have quite a bit of money and grants to get to small businesses. Um, the state of New York, if anyone on here is from New York, just did a, a request for a proposal for um, small businesses led by BIPOC and women-led companies that was giving up, I believe, up to $500,000 in grants. And this is non-dilutive, meaning they're not taking a percentage ownership and you don't have to pay it back. So this is the type of funding you want to get because it's going to give you the space to figure out what it is that you're doing. I'm a firm believer that venture should only be used to fuel, meaning once you figure out what it is that you're going to do, you come to someone like me because it's like, look, I figured out I have my first three customers and I'm ready to like move quickly. And I'm like, yes, I'm with you. Let's do it. I'm kind of like, you know, that fuel to help the fire grow bigger. Um, so it's definitely build back better. Check with your local um, state departments of small business. Um, look up what build back better programs are coming through. The, the U.S. Small Business Association um, also has like on their website, like state by state, like what the programs are. They actually have a PDF that you can download that tells you what programs each state has along with links. So you can go directly mm -hmm. there to check out. Um, there are, you know, micro lending platforms. Grameen, which is known to lend internationally, also loans in the United States. So that's Kiva. Um, and so those mm -hmm. are different places. Um, Atheon, which is been around for a long time that does a little bit more in terms of micro lending is a great platform when you're getting started. Um, those are loans, so you will have to pay them back, but they're very flexible in terms of credit requirements and things like that. Um, there is a lot of accelerator programs that you can also enter. There's many, many that will give you investments. So Techstars, which is the big accelerator program around the nation, um, has an initiative, they received $80 million from J.P. Morgan Chase to build initiatives and invest in um, people of color led, you know, startups. Um, and so these are all resources that are available that are non, that that's not going to take money or, or equity from you and will give you the space to sort of, and the support you need as you're trying to figure out what it is that you're doing. Thank you. That's super helpful. Um, we have time for one last question. And um, so I'm gonna ask one about building a team. Um, Cause I think it's something that's relevant in any stage of business, um, any kind of business you're doing. 
What are your tips for building a great team? And you talked a little bit about the value of your partner and, and what it means to build that relationship. Can you talk a little bit too about the value of building a team and what that means for a business as you start up? You cannot build it by yourself. You, you just can't. And so the goal shouldn't be to try to do that. You're going to need other people and you're going to need their help and you're going to have to sell them. I was saying to someone, you know, I feel like most of my job is sales, <laughs> um, you know, and one of the things I have to sell is this vision of what I'm building to potential employees. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and then I have to, once they become an employee, I have to keep them engaged. Like why should they continue to work for Genius Guild versus anyone else or any other place that they can go? And I think when you have that view that people don't have to work for you, they don't have to do anything for you. That your job as a CEO is to continue to sell the dream, continue to sell the vision and why someone should care. It's very, you will find that people will be very attracted to working with you. You'll find that people will want to stay because they know that you appreciate them. And they also know that you have this bigger vision. I think most people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. I think we, we all want to do that. And so for you as the CEO or founder of your company, it's really important for you to communicate that to everyone, but especially those people you're working with day to day. But you're going to have to do that. And there's a couple of ways to do it. I always talk about you need a good lawyer. You do. Um, you need a good accountant. You really do. The IRS knows everything and they will find you. <laughs> Don't think for a moment. <laughs> So having those two on your team are very, very important. Um, you need a lieutenant. And I talk about this in detail in the book, like somebody who can make decisions when you're not able to, because you cannot and nor should you make every decision. As a CEO, you should only make the important decision. And so um, I'm always reminded of the story someone told about President Obama. And President Obama in his closet had the same suit, except for that time, you know, we remember he wore the tan suit, but all the other Ooh. suits, had, right, that was a controversy, all <laughs> the other suits, except for the tan suit, were like dark blue. And someone asked him why, and he said, because I have so many decisions to make each day, I do not want, I want to reduce the decisions I have to make. I know that this looks good, I take it and, and run with it. I literally have done that with my own closet and I'm a fashion person. Like I have things like, I know exactly what works and what doesn't work. Everything in my closet fits because I don't want to have to think about that. I do not want to have to think about that. And so for you as a CEO, you want to reduce the amount of decisions that you have to make. And the way you do that is by trusting others to make decisions and empowering others to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And there's other people yeah. that, have that I talked in more detail about. Thank you so much. And that, that, that makes me think about when you were talking earlier about um, failure is just data, um, because I think it's harder sometimes to apply that to people, but knowing that as you build a team, if you make a mistake or if it's not a great fit, or if you're not doing it the way that you're supposed to be doing it, it's data um, and to keep trying. Everyone wants to be an A student. It might mean that they're not an A student with you. And so think of it in this way, you're releasing them to find what it is that they're good at. You want them to win and they're not winning with you and you're not winning with them. So release them so that they can find what it is that they're an A student at. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rohini. And thank you to all of you for such great questions. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. The chat was just so busy and it was so interactive. Everybody was just, asking questions and some others others were answering other people's questions so it was a really wonderful chat this whole conversation was so informative so invaluable and honestly it has been so inspiring to just hear you Catherine and Laura and what you have done and um, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us today uh, we really appreciate that thank you for having me and I'm so very proud of you Laura and what you're building congratulations Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. That means uh, that means a lot. And thank you to the library. We I, I love the library. And so it feels so great to be a part of something that you all are putting on. Thank you all so much. And great book suggestions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so excited.
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you talked about reading other books too, apart from just the business ones. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This event is being recorded and will be available on the HCLS YouTube channel in a couple of days. Tomorrow we'll send out a link to everything that we could possibly, um, you know, all the books that were suggested by Catherine and all of the links that we have, we'll send that out in an email tomorrow and uh, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, Laura. Thank you, guys.